you you've taught about this you've taught a course on psychological explanation and it begins with the the classical role of representation and psychological explanation and i i believe that you you cited fodor and pilishin on this view and that's strong representationalism so what just what is strong representationalism in this uh this uh subject of psychological explanation Yeah, so psychological explanation um, has, is a is a fairly big topic. I mean, we've been talking about psychological explanation from the beginning, and the, where the focus has been uh, scientific psychological explanation, explanation in the psychological sciences. Um, there's also an issue. I mean, we that's we also explain and predict each other's behavior uh, in, in in everyday life, and psychological explanation. Uh, so it's crucial to our to our getting getting around in the world and getting along with other people. Um, attribution of representation in those two domains, I think, is is quite different. Although there's some there's some commonalities, but I think so. The photo, back to the so pollution was is was concerned primarily with scientific psychological explanation. Fodor's concerned with both. So they're both um, what I call or what's been what other people call strong representationalists in that they endorse the, 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 the thesis that I've been calling robust representational okay. realism. Fodor had, uh, so psychological explanation is explanation in terms of mental representations and computations over mental representations, computational processes that run off mental representations. So um, that was their account, both photo and Polition's accounts of, uh, of what's going on in the brain when, uh, when an organism thinks, acts, and so on. Um, I don't, Fodor also has an account of propositional attitudes. The, um, the, the, the states that get attributed in our, in our everyday lives when we predict and explain what other people are going to do and when we justify our own behavior to others. And that's also sometimes called strong representationalism. It's certainly related to the view that I've been explaining uh, in the cognitive sciences. And the idea there is that propositional attitudes like beliefs and desires are relations to internal sentences. So propositional attitudes are mental representations or relations to mental representations and uh, psychological processes, the sorts of processes that uh, we talk about when we might say why somebody comes to believe something or that we, that we use to explain, say, why somebody ran out of a building. Mary ran out of the building because she uh, believed that it's on fire and, of course, she desires not to, not to be hurt. And the belief and desire interact and they produce the action of leaving the building. Uh, so according to strong representationalism, the belief is a functional relation to an internal sentence and a desire is a different functional relation, all, but also to an internal sentence and they interact in a certain way and they produce behavior. So the key idea here is that propositional attitudes like beliefs, desires, hopes, wishes, wants, fears, intentions, that's the framework that we use to predict and explain uh, behavior in, in, in ordinary life. Um, those are, according to the strong representationalist view, those really are re different relations, you know, different attitudes, fear that P versus belief that P, that's, those would be different computational or functional relations to internal sentences. And that's what the attitudes are. So that's that's strong representationalism. And so there's clearly, you know, it's clearly uh, a general view about how the mind works, a general view about psychological explanation. To explain psychological processes then would be to attribute to the subject a relation to an internal representation that has a particular meaning, and the inter in 
in our common sense explanations, it's going to be the interaction of those that produce behavior. That's kind of the standard. Well, that, yeah, I don't want to say it's the standard view of, of what's happening in common sense, but it's the standard interpretation by philosophers of what's going on when people attribute beliefs and desires to explain each other's behavior. And since you... So heavily committed to these things, representations. And since you mentioned earlier having studied with Pat and Paul Churchland, I take it that this is not the way that they would go about psychological explanation since they're eliminativists about uh, the beliefs and, and these propositional attitudes being in the brain. So how would, how would they explain uh, our behavior uh, if they're not going to endorse the strong re representationalist way of doing it? Yeah, so the Churchlands uh, have repudiated any commitment to uh, to beliefs and desires. They think of they think of uh, beliefs and desires as being theoretical entities, part of a complex theory that we, you know, just ordinary people use in uh, in, in attempting to predict and explain each other's behavior. But they think that that theory is outmoded, false. Uh, problematic in various ways, and it would be better to replace it by more directly by kind of uh, an informed neur uh, neurology. Mm -hmm. So they think that the whole belief desire framework is is a it, it should be scrapped. It's 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 a theory, but it's a bad theory. Mm -hmm. And you reference a few other challenges beyond. Can I just say one thing while yeah, following please. up on that? The idea that it's a theory, though, is important because it's, Fodor shares that view, too. Fodor just thinks it's a good theory. Mm. So the dispute between the realists and the eliminativists is not about whether belief desire framework is a theory. It's about whether it's a good theory. Mm.